Welcome in to Cut the Killer Carbs, right here with Dr. Justin Anderson, Metabolic Coaching. Of course, metaboliccoaching.net, check it out on the web. Of course, the direct number to Dr. Anderson, 448-0322. That's 448-0322. Let me say good morning once again to a Dr. Justin Anderson. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm fabulous, Wade. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I can't complain. I'm uh, just... Uh, you know, uh, I get hyped up. I get hyper, uh, you know, about yeah. buying things and doing mm -hmm. things. And then I, you know, when it comes to weight loss, I get pretty hyper and hyped up about that too. Uh, we get a lot of lot of texts and calls in on the show about how to, you know, get back to good solid health, and and that's always important. I would tell you that uh, the single most thing you can do, since we just did two hours of gun talk, and people have been texting in saying, "Well, what do you do in this situation? What do you do in this?" Situation? The number one thing you can do that I that I, that I learned also out of the, the the tragic events in Las Vegas mm -hmm. is guess what, Doctor Anderson? What do you think that one thing is? Be prepared. No. Well, yeah, I mean, be prepared. I mean, but that's not the number one thing. What is you know it? what you need to do? You need to be in shape. You need to be able to move yeah. from point A to point B. You know, one thing that stood out to to me in those videos, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people were taking videos. Uh, you know, as people rush to safety, people trying to scale a fence, yeah. people trying to get out of harm's way. If you're fat and out of shape and can't run from point A to point B, and, 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 and by the way, if you just can't do that, you really put yourself in a bad situation. Case in point, when I went off to Iraq, and of course I was in the Army Reserves, which, you know, one week in a month, you know, maybe a 30-day jaunt here and there. Yeah, I had to take a PT test every once in a while. I had to maintain certain standards. But the reality of it was, you know, I was overweight. And so I go to Fort Bragg, and they say, hey, soldier, you're you're overweight. And I'm like, good, do I get to stay home? No. You know what I'm <laughs> not saying? Not an option. Yeah, right? not an option. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I didn't pass the tape test. Does that mean I don't deploy because I've got my BMIs too high? No, you're still deploying to Iraq. The problem was when I got to Iraq, I weighed about 225, 30 pounds at 5 foot 10. Um, I'm loaded up with gear. I've got my IBA on. It's 120 degrees in, 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 in the sun. And I continuously have to take an IV because I'm passing out due to the heat exhaustion and all this stuff. Right. And it just dawned on me. I thought, hey, you know what? I'm becoming a combat casualty without getting shot here because I am so fat. And I cannot shoot and move. And we were having engagements, you know, we, we, whether it be by mortar or small arms fire, whatever it was. And right then it dawned on me that being in shape is the most critical attribute that you can have. That meaning weight loss and being able to get out of harm's way. I think a lot of people instinctively, they know that, you know, they would like to be in better shape. They would like to not carry around the extra weight. And people know, people instinctively know, oh, you know, if I didn't carry around this extra 40 pounds, my knees would feel better. My back would feel better. Um, the question is, how do you do it? Uh, the typical advice that we've, the typical standard advice we've been given for 30 years, which is cut out the fat, you know, eat more healthy whole grains, work out, exercise more than you, uh, the, more exercise out more calories than you put in. It just doesn't work very well for most people. And so the human body, it, when I very first gave my, just to refresh everybody's memory. So what got me interested in this in the beginning was that in, uh, uh, a, it's been almost five years now, uh, my wife was kicking me out of bed every night because I was snoring so loud she couldn't sleep. And the reason I was snoring was because I had gotten too fat. And at that point I was 213 pounds. Uh, today I'm 170, 171, and so um, <laughs> you know by the pound. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you weigh every day. You check it. Wow. Uh, a quick, two quick tips for weight loss. Number one, weigh yourself every day and write down the weight. Just the act of writing down the weight, even if you don't change anything else, it changes your mindset. And writing down your weight every day it makes you conscious of your weight and makes you conscious that, hey, you know, my weight is a priority for me. 
it's something that I need to work on. So just the act of write, weighing yourself every day and writing down the weight does help with weight loss. And the second tip is keeping a food diary where you write down everything that you eat. That also helps. Uh, keeping a food diary can be a real pain. I've done it myself. I've done it for about six weeks. When I broke out in hives, did you know I had the hives? I did yeah. not. No. So I had these hives and I was trying to figure out why on earth I was getting the hives. And it, I kept a food diary with every food that I ate, everything that I drank, and every supplement that I put in my mouth. Because I knew uh, it was something that I was putting in my mouth. And it turned out that it was a certain brand of a certain magnesium supplement that I was taking. And so eventually when I stopped that, the hives went away. So writing down your daily weight, uh, that helps reinforce that your weight's a priority. And then doing a food diary, that helps too. But I got, the whole reason I got into this was because my wife was kicking me out of bed because I was snoring so loud. Uh, and I remembered from medical school that your body can either run on carbohydrates and it turns carbohydrates into sugar, or your body can run on fat. And if your body runs on fat, you burn off your own fat in the process. And um, you, I tell people, well, we count net carbs. We count grams of net carbs. And well, what does that mean? The only thing that a net carb means is that's a gram of carbohydrate that you eat that your body turns into sugar. So if you eat 20 grams of net carbohydrate daily, then that's the equivalent of putting 20 grams of sugar glucose into your bloodstream. Uh, that standard American diet can be up to like 200 grams of net carbs a day, which is 200 grams of sugar that you put into your bloodstream every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, that's why, essentially, that's why people are diabetic. Because if you put 200 grams of sugar into your bloodstream and you happen to be someone who is intolerant of sugar, uh, which is like a type 2 diabetic, then you're going to have really high blood sugars. You'll have uncontrollable diabetes. I had a nice lady she called and she wanted, you know, she, she wanted to get control of the sugar for her husband. And she, she said, uh, actually left a message and she's like, you know, I just, we just need to do something to get control. Well, to get control of your sugar, you just stop feeding, stop feeding sugar into the system. That's step number one, and that's the biggest step, and that's the step you continue on and on. There are some people who are just what's what I call carbohydrate intolerant, and you've heard of lactose intolerance, right? People with lactose intolerance, that milk protein or milk products, it's the protein that causes them digestive upset, and they have a physical reaction to lactose. Well, lots of people are carbohydrate intolerant, which means if they eat carbohydrates and they pump that much sugar into their system, then they get physical symptoms from the carbohydrates. And those physical symptoms are overweight, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, messes up their cholesterol, causes inflammation and arthritis, etc. Heart disease, not to mention all those things. All those things. And so the, for the lady who called, I mean, to make it simple, your husband is carbohydrate intolerant. You stop feeding 200 grams of sugar into the system, 200 grams of carbohydrates, that and convert to sugar. That convert to sugar. Instead, go down to 20. And that's the first biggest step to correct your, your diabetes and your blood sugar. Well, I have to admit that there's absolutely everything you say about this absolutely true. Because uh, when I back off carbs uh, for any length of time, whether it's two days, three days, whatever, I, don't, I just feel better. I mean, it, I just feel better. And again, no. I, you know, when I was in my 20s, I could eat carbs all day long not gain a pound of fat, uh, you know, again, it was really weird. But as we age, our metabolism changes. And by the way, carbs do affect younger people more and more. We see that. Mm -hmm. You see it with kids. Uh, you see kids it with kids. They're getting diabetes. They're, getting, they're, getting, they're getting type 2. Sure. Uh -huh. sure. Exactly. But it didn't affect me until later in life. It started to really affect me uh, around the age of around uh, 30. Mm -hmm. 30 is when I started... You know, putting on a little bit of weight here and there. I, I, at 30, I probably weighed about, oh, let's say 180 pounds. You know, uh, and I thought, oh, you know, uh, and I jumped up about. What did you weigh when you were like a junior in high school? When I was a junior in high school, I probably weighed about 145. So real thin. But I was real a thin. real thin, but I was a long distance runner. You know, I ran half marathons and things like that. When I was kind of, when I was growing up as a kid, I always considered myself to be a little bit chubby. I was a little bit big. You, you were. Know? 
and uh, which is not surprising because I grew up on uh, well, as I grew up on sugar cereal and my three favorite I, for breakfast I would have something like a sugar cereal plus toast plus uh, orange juice, which is carbs, carbs, and carbs, which your body turns into sugar, <laughs> sugar, sugar, and uh, sugar is a uniquely fattening type of food. And so anyway, and my three favorite foods, somebody asked me one time, what are your three favorite foods? And I said, mashed potatoes, baked potato, and french fries. That's carbs, carbs, and carbs. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, <laughs> they said, well, that's all just one food. That's just a potato. And I was like, yeah, but it's my favorite, you know. And so when I was a junior in high school, I was about 180 pounds. And when I started uh, losing weight, I, I kind of had the thought in my head. I was like, you know, I want to get down to about 180. And I switched over to cutting out the carbohydrates on the diet, instead eating a lot of fat. Eating a lot of fat. Com I eat a lot of fat combined with a lot of green leafy vegetables. That's basically the formula. And when I switched over to doing that, I got down to 180 and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, this is what I was when I was a junior in high school. And then I got down to 175. I got down to 170. I went down to 166. And then I kind of bumped back up from 166 to 171 and just leveled out there. Yeah. And that's been my ideal weight. But the point is that I weigh 10 pounds less today than I weighed as a junior in high school. And it's not hard. I mean, it's, it's not. I've lost weight before by starving myself. Yeah. Starving yourself, it does work. You can starve yourself. Uh, it works, but it's miserable. You know, you feel hungry all the time. You have an empty pit in your stomach. You always want to eat. Um, and by cutting out the carbohydrates in the diet and adding a lot of healthy fat, you don't feel hungry and you don't have that pit in your stomach. And I weigh 10 pounds less than I did when I was a junior in high school. And I would hope that you could do the same thing. Now, are you suggesting because of that, that I should weigh 145. <laughs> no, hey, I was 145 in, in, in a junior in high school. Well, you'd be 135 if you were 10 pounds. If you were 10 pounds, uh, less. yeah, I don't, and, I don't see that, 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 that. That's not that, what I'm suggesting. That, I'll be unhealthy. I think. What What I'm suggesting is that um, even if you've even if you've been kind of overweight your whole life, you may be surprised at what kind of what kind of results you can achieve. By doing a low carbohydrate diet, yeah, um, because uh, essentially I was carbohydrate intolerant as a kid, you know, and the carb the carbohydrates caused me to be overweight, and so by cutting them out, uh, my weight was better than it was even as a junior in high school. I think the problem with with me and carbs, and I think for maybe a lot of people, is the fact that carbs are so readily available. I mean, they're in the fast foods. They're they're easily obtainable. Yes. Uh, everywhere you look is is, is a carb. Uh, the the snack. Why at work? Why, why Wade? Why is that the fact? Well, I don't know why. I think it's because maybe it's cheaper. It's because it's cheap. Okay. So okay. It's because it's cheap. So if you're going to go to a restaurant, you know, if you order a let's say enchilada dinner, right? Mm -hmm. So the most expensive thing on your enchilada dinner is the meat that they put inside that enchilada. True. The tortilla is cheap. The, then they give you a big side of rice, cheap. A big side of beans, cheap. And they give you a big thing of tortilla chips, cheap. So you pay $7 for uh, your enchilada dinner. Maybe there's a dollar worth of ground beef in there. And there's probably 30, cent, 30 cents or, or, or 75 cents of all these other carbs. And so people get taken advantage of. And that's one of the things that kind of irks me. Is that people, uh, when, you, when you go out to eat, if, even if you order a burger, right? The most expensive thing is that patty of meat that's on your burger. And the vegetables don't cost them very much. Uh, the hamburger bun doesn't cost much. The potatoes cost, you know, you go to the store and you buy a 15-pound bag of potatoes, right? Mm -hmm. And it costs $3. That's, that's why they're always eager to give you fries, you know? Because that's $0.10 cents worth of fries and they sell it to you for $1.50. If you go into the grocery store and they have powdered donuts, and the package of powdered donuts is like, uh, you know, the individual package is maybe $2 for that individual package. Well, it contains 10 cents worth of ingredients. So food manufacturers take advantage of people by selling really cheap food um, 
at really inflated prices because that's how they can make money. Yeah. Well, that's how they make money because it is, you're right. It, it is a lot cheaper. And so it makes perfect sense that, you know, like, for example, I was talking about that I'd gone to a Mexican food restaurant on last Thursday. Well, the dish I ordered, I, the reason I ordered it, it was the seafood dish, and it had scallops and shrimp. Right. And I thought, man, I'm going to have shrimp and scallops. It's be healthy, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I don't want all the beans and rice. and But it comes with, but I didn't eat it. Uh -huh. But I stuck with the, the scallops and shrimp. And, uh, I mean, so even in a Mexican food restaurant, you can find things if you if you... Look at the menu and say, "Oh, I, I want you know skirt steak. Yeah, I exactly. want fajitas. I don't. I won't eat the tortilla with the fajitas, but I'll have the fajitas and the bell peppers and the onions, which are all wonderful." In a lot of Mexican food restaurants, you can order just the skirt steak. Yeah, uh, or you can order the fajitas and just tell them no tortillas. And several places like Abuelos, they'll bring you out uh, uh, lettuce leaves. Yeah, you can I mean that to wrap your that's right, and that makes that makes sense. But it's it's choices, and it's. But it's being educated about those choices that, that, that helps you to achieve the goal. That's right. Right. And, and, and there's a lot, there are a lot of weight, weight loss kind of hypnosis type of products out there that they kind of make you aware of your weight and they say, you know, you're going to lose weight. But you can't, those products, they don't work unless you actually know what to do with the information. So you have to know what to eat and what to avoid in order to make them work. Uh, let's go to the phones. Good morning. Welcome to the show. So how are you doing today? Good, good. I want to tell you, you're talking to a guy who is a weight loss success story. Tell us about it. I used to, you're talking to a guy who you, one time used to weigh 270 pounds, you know, and now I weigh 170. Congratulations, man. That's a big improvement. I used to wear a 46 trouser, now I'm wearing a 35, 34. Ooh, that's great. So tell us how you did it. Um... What, what caused me to do all this weight thing is I went to a, a little store called Walmart during a little town called Stanford, and they was having a cholesterol screening test for free for everyone to do it if they want to. Well, I did it, and it came back. My cholesterol was 435. Wow. That's pretty high. It, the cholesterol it, screening tests they give at places like that usually are higher than that measured in a lab, but that is still really high. So they sent a letter to my doctor. Literally sent him a letter to my doctor. My doctor called me in, gave me a, a shortest lecture I've ever received in my life. He told me to either get it down or make my funeral arrangements. And the very next day, I got on a diet of my own, that I'm come up with my own. And then 18 months later, I was 100 pounds lighter. Congratulations. Just. Uh, the one thing that you've done is you've found what works for you, and you should really, you know, you have to stick with it long term, and you'll keep that 100 pounds off. That's fabulous. You know how long I've been keeping it off now? 18, oh no, how long? I am on my 18th year. Uh, that's wow. awesome. That's good. Are you going to tell us your diet? Are you going to keep us in the, in the suspense? I just, uh, instead of eating like ice cream and fries, Stuff, I started using my crock pot. I literally lived out of my crock pot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. And instead of eating ice cream, I eat yogurt. Uh, instead of eating fried stuff all the time, I bake stuff. And uh, instead of eating out at restaurants all the time, like eating uh, hamburgers and all that kind of stuff, I went to like uh, a favorite taco place, and they, instead of having beef tacos, had chicken. Hmm. And that's how I did it. So it sounds to me like that you avoided a lot of the carbs just by by d d using utilizing a crock pot. Which, by the way, we utilize at our house a lot. Crock pots are great uh, items to use mm -hmm. uh, for that. Um, the little new wave ovens that you can purchase. Uh, if, when I first saw them, I thought, "Well, these are kind of a gag kind of thing on late night TV," but they're really good. Uh, those new wave ovens, you can just throw in a chicken breast and that thing and five minutes later it's ready you is know? that ron popeil no i don't know if it was him but but the but if you don't have a new wave oven you got to get one we use it all the time now i mean because it really does cook you know beef chicken legs chicken breasts uh those kinds of things a lot faster than a conventional oven would would cook them yeah and so it makes it easy and when you can do like what this caller's talking about when you can modify it to, in such a way that it's healthy uh -huh. 
and low carb and do it quickly, that's the key. Yeah, you, you can really make it work. Yeah. I right? just thought you'd like to hear a success story. Well, thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your call. You have a, and for both of you, I have a, you have a great and wonderful day. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I, I, so that's the deal. You, you, you just got to do a little homework and get creative. But if you do that and, and, and again, steam some broccoli, I'm, I'm satisfied. That's the thing about me is that it doesn't matter to me. It's just, I think the reason why most people, if they're like me, the reason why I fail on diets or fail to, to achieve the goals mm -hmm. is because of convenience. Yeah. It's the convenience factor. It's the convenience of just going through a fast food drive You're telling me the, the health food coach doesn't send you with lunch? No. <laughs> no, she does not. She would, I guess, if I asked her, but I don't. I mean, because what I, I try to do is, and she's asked me before, and I'll say, well, sweetheart, look, uh, I'll, I'll just intermittent fast today. I won't eat till I get home and Ooh. when she cooks. And she cooks wonderfully but at home, and it's it's a low-carb meal every time. There's a few a few good things you can really pick apart from that guy, or take away from that guy's plan. He said, number one, I switched from eating ice cream to yogurt. And so... Number one, eating ice cream, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna have a lot of carbohydrates from the milk in there, and then also you have all the sugar added onto it. And the sugar is um, uh, sugar, sugars like table sugar are especially fattening. So that's an awesome switch right there. Number two, um, yogurt may have listed on if you're gonna buy yogurt, you should only buy full fat plain yogurt. Uh, don't buy any that has any flavor in it. Uh, because the flavorings in the yogurt usually add a ton of carbohydrates. They'll, to, briefly, uh, they'll say raspberry flavored yogurt. And you'll have the plain yogurt sitting in one hand, the raspberry flavored yogurt, it's made with 100% all natural raspberries. Okay, well, so the raspberries only have four net carbs per cup, so there shouldn't be a whole bunch of extra carbohydrates in your yogurt. But you turn the yogurt over and you read the label, and the one that has raspberries in it, will have 15 or 20 more carbs in it than the plain. Mm -hmm. So you should only buy plain yogurt because what they do is they use con like concentrated raspberry juice that concentrate it down to suck all the sugar out of it and put it into your yogurt. Um, also, a good thing about yogurt, yogurt contains uh, all those probiotic bacteria. Those probiotic bacteria are helpful uh, in helping people with digestive problems and also uh, changing, uh, helping with weight loss by changing the bacteria that's in your gut and it'll say on the package of yogurt, even if it's plain yogurt, it'll say uh, 11 to 15 net carbs per cup. But that's not exactly true. And the reason it's not true is that they count the carbohydrates in the yogurt before they ferment it. So it'll say it'll be 15 net carbs, which is 15 grams of sugar before fermentation, and then they lacto-ferment it. And so about half of those net carbs are turned into lactic acid. And the other half remains as sugar. So really you only have about, instead of 11 to 15, you only have maybe 5 to 7 grams of net carbs in yogurt, even though it says on the back uh, more than that. So mm -hmm. you, you take your yogurt and you, you only buy plain, you divide the net carbs in half. Some people might even say you only take a third of the net carbs and you use that for your calculation. Also, cooking at home, you avoid all of the appetite-stimulating uh, food additives. Oh, no kidding. You avoid the MSG. You, I mean, you, you, you can add salt and spices and all this sort. Of, you can add wonderful things to the stuff you cook at home that make it taste great. I love the, uh, the pico de gallo and the guacamole that my wife makes at home. They're both fabulous. And I'm like, you know, did you add something weird in here? Because this tastes great. And no, it's just, <laughs> you know, I was like, is there MSG in here? This is wonderful. Um, and no, it's just salt and lime juice. That's it. And like sea salt and lime juice. And so um, by cooking at home, you avoid the MSG, you avoid the appetite stimulants, and you can avoid a lot of the addictive foods like the sugars and the wheat. So yeah. that's, that's great. But, and one thing I don't do to people is if they found something that really works for them, I don't tell them, oh, well, you need to change and switch over to your do, protocol. Switch over to my protocol. Do it right. my way. That, absolutely wrong. You know? but I, I would agree with that, and that's a fair statement. But I would also say that uh, education is the key, and that's what we do on this show. It's an education situation. I mean, educating people to really think about, really think about what they're putting in their mouth. Yeah. Is, yeah. That, is, that, is that healthy? Is that detrimental? I mean, because as you talk about 
whether you're at a restaurant or you're at the grocery store, there are so many food products out there. The food industry, by the way, is, has, has learned uh, for, for decades. How do I get Justin Anderson, Dr. Anderson, addicted to my product? Well, we'll slip it in a little high fructose corn syrup in there. Uh, we'll sip in a little corn syrup, uh, cane sugar. Oh, but it's organic, you know. Right. Oh, no, no. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll slip in addictive substances that are in these foods to get you addicted to their product so you will be a return, repeat customer, mm -hmm. buying it over and yep. over and over and over again. I will tell you that after doing these radio programs with you and, of course, Dr. Edwards and Gray and everybody, all these medical shows I've done for years and years and years. I find myself fascinated when I go to the grocery store and almost people watch because I will see, and it never fails, I'll see somebody who, a great place to go, by the way, is, is, is uh, to see this in real time, is uh, 98th and Quaker Market Street. Now, I don't shop there a lot because I think they're wildly expensive. Right. And you can get similar products, if not better, at Walmart for a lot less money. Uh, I'll just say that. But when I do go, and I was in there yesterday because I went and I was kind of hungry, and I thought, man, I'm going to go get something to eat. And instead of going through the Taco Villa drive through which I normally would have done after going to the bank, whatever, I thought just a little bit of extra effort, I can get off my duff, walk into Market Street, and get baked cod with Brussels sprouts and green mm -hmm. beans. So that's what I had for lunch yesterday. That's what I had. It's, but like, no, a, actually, it's actually, like a whole new Wade. There's yeah, a whole new yeah, Wade it, it, sitting it, it in front is, of us. It today. is me. It is me, right? It's a whole new Wade. It's a whole new so me. When did this change happen? Well, Wade? it's been changed because of you and, and other shows like this. Because I clearly didn't think about it that much. I mean, I would think, well, I just had a burrito. I mean, what's with tortilla? What's the big deal? I used to think that pizza, but I used to think pizza was the perfect health food because it contained. I did the too. The bread group, you needed yeah, bread. Yeah, vegetables and, and meat. And yeah. Vegetable, I used to think you could survive cheese. on it. Perfect food. Perfect food, a pizza, because of the meat, the vegetables, and the breads, which, by the way, the USD pyramid guideline Look just like that. would say that, yeah. that a pizza is perfect food. It's a perfect food. Yeah. It's not a perfect food, right? But anyway, back to my story. As I'm standing in line, and you know, people walking along the little, you know, pushing their carts and everything. I would see, you know, a, a lady walk by in, 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 in gym clothes, you know. I thought you were saying drag. No, spandex, you know, she, like she just came from the gym. And I would look in her basket, fresh fruit, vegetables, you know, no, very little carbs in there right. whatsoever. And then you'd see the guy coming right behind her who was 100 pounds overweight. He had a case of Cokes. He had sugary donuts, sugary snacks mm -hmm. in, his, in his cart. And I would look at that guy and think, okay, you need to listen to this show. Yeah. If you if you if you really want to lose weight, you, because th there's you know, two there's, there's two shining examples right there, and the lady ripped up, looking like uh, not necessarily a bodybuilder, but clearly in great shape. Yeah. Looks good. She's probably in her forties. She looks as good as any twenty year old lady walking around out there. And then you see a guy similar age. He's a hundred pounds overweight. He's struggling to push his cart around full of junk. Yeah. I mean, that's my point, right? It's crazy. But if you go and look at that, I mean, you can just sit there and watch. And it's really fascinating to me to watch that. And it, another thing he had in his cart, which I was like, oh, well, hey, man, orange juice. He had like a gallon jug of yeah. orange juice. And we know what orange juice does. It's and, a bad idea. And, well, that's a good reminder for people is that ounce for ounce... Uh, fruit juice, whether it's orange juice or 100% organic orange juice or apple juice, ounce for ounce, has exactly the same amount of sugar in it as a regular Coca-Cola. Yeah. So orange juice is like a Coca-Cola with a vitamin C tablet dropped in it. Because people say, oh, I need my vitamin C. Well, it's kind of like drinking a Coca-Cola with a vitamin C tablet in it. Yeah, not good. It's not not it a It jacks food. your insulin to the wall. And I've had a lot of clients who are diabetics who... Um, who drink, who would drink juice a lot because it's healthy, you know, and it really messes up their sugar. Or they would drink things like Powerade, Gatorade, those sort of things while they're out on the tractor. You know, they're, they're, they're farmers. 
they're out on the tractor they need to get rehydrated they're drinking powerade gatorade uh orange juice i used to be a big gatorade drinker to get uh, not anymore uh to be to rehydrate themselves but they're really blowing their blood sugar up yeah that's right i used to love gatorades and i would drink them all the time thinking well it's uh, you know again it's got a little potassium in there it's got electrolytes it should be good but then when you look at the sugars on the bottle of a gatorade and by the way i have Mm-hmm. And it's per serving, and a lot of times you got to read labels carefully. A couple, couple of servings. But you there. say, okay, per serving, 39 grams of sugar yeah. in a Gatorade. 39 grams. So if, if it's per con- serving, and it's 2.5 servings uh-huh. per bottle, that is a load of sugar. So that, that gets you to 100 grams. Whoa. And 100, 100 grams, that's 100 grams of sugar that goes directly into your bloodstream. Yeah, and, and you're uh, not losing weight. And, and you, that's why you're struggling with your weight. Um, some a uh, drink you can make, and it's something that's kind of part of the Morley Robbins protocol, is you can take 32 ounces of water. In your 32 ounces of water, you put a quarter teaspoon of sea salt, and you put a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon of um, cream of tartar, and that has some potassium in it that you need. You can squeeze a lime in there. Put that in 32 ounces of water, and there you, know, there you go. Now that Morley, I, I got to say something right here, and he's going to be out on the show, I think next month, live in the studio. Morley's but, coming out. Yeah, but that Morley, oh. he was on the show yesterday via telephone. Yeah, I, I listened to it. But Morley, show. that guy, man, I'll tell you what, that dude, he knows. I mean, that guy's amazing. I talked to him yesterday on the phone after the show for about an hour. He's got a great course you can sign up for and take, online course, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I tell you, that guy was amazing. And uh, and I, I can't get enough of, of talking with him about well, some of this stuff. But let's go to the text line. A couple of texts coming in, Dr. Anderson. Dr. Oz says yogurt has insects in the ingredients. Kind of turns me off. Is that true? Insects and yogurt. I have no clue. I don't either. I don't know about that. That's kind of interesting. I know there's a lot of insect parts in chocolate. I, I, I've heard that. I, I, have, I have no clue. <laughs> You know, there, there's a funny thing, um, is that in India, in India they had this explosion of type 2 diabetes. And one of the theories was that what happened was when they started using pesticides, and the pesticides and herbicides and all that sort of stuff in India, was that they didn't have as many insects on their fruits and vegetables, so they weren't eating as many insects. So... Uh, Insects are actually good for you, so, by the so way. So maybe it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, they are really and, good and for odd, And I don't want to be strange, but um, if you think about, you know, if you eat organic organic lettuce or organic vegetables or whatever, there will be insects there. And the insects, uh, they have in their... I've, I've thought of this. This is a way that I can make a probiotic capsule. <laughs> you know, because whatever the aphids or whatever that are on your lettuce, yeah. they have all the digestive enzymes inside their body to properly digest lettuce mm-hmm. or whatever fruit or vegetable it is that you're eating yes and so i'm not telling you to go out and eat insects however i've often thought you know if you eat the aphid that's on the lettuce then that probably helps you digest your lettuce that maybe does. that's how you get your probiotics or that's maybe, a good maybe idea maybe that's how we got our probiotics before we had capsules well you definitely i i, I firmly believe and, and morley talked about this not on yesterday's show but another show but we were talking about you know the uptake of copper as compared to watch your iron. Iron's a real big problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, when when uh, back to the food industry, they were interjecting iron into everything, fortified with iron, 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 mm-hmm. and it's really been detrimental to a lot of Americans. And then you can show on a graph that that the, the, in, the hey. that interjecting iron into the American diet has been a miserable failure. But all that being said, is that you know, I, I find that fascinating. But, but w- another text coming in, Dr. Anderson, what is the carbs and sugars in beer? Now, this is a favorite of mine because if anything within what I'm trying to accomplish and, and do yeah. is that I am a beer drinker. Um, I don't drink a, I don't drink it at all during the week. But on the weekends, sure, I'll, I will have three or four beers with my meal. And I know that that stuff is convertible into uh Sugars, right, as well as straight grain alcohols, which I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, 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 a whiskey drinker, put it that way, but but that that can't, so explain that well, to the to the texture. That's a good question. Melody, the health coach, needs to go down to the liquor store and buy you some 
buy you some straight grain <laughs> alcohol so you don't get as many carbs. <laughs> she hates it when you say that. But anyway. Um, well, okay, there's, there's several problems with beer. Uh, I, I don't know for individual beers, I'm, uh, but you know, the, the, the very light beers, they probably have about 10 grams of net carbs, maybe it's nine. Do you, do you know, Wayne? Yeah, actually, it's less than that. Uh, it's about five grams of carbs in an ounce of Coors Light, my favorite brand. And so, again, per container for 12 ounces. Mm -hmm. But five grams, so do the math. If I have four, I'm at 20. I'm already b breaching limit. Right. If, and so then, you know, again, if you have... So I, I would tell people, you know, you can count the carbs in your beer. You can include that in your diet program. And uh, so if you're aiming for less than 20 net carbs a day, which will switch you over to burning fat, then you can say, well, that five grams of carbon, carbs in my beer is going to be, you know, add that and you have 15 left, okay? Dr. Bernstein, the author of Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Revolution, he says that basically people can have a drink a day, even if it's a beer, without messing up their blood sugar, their insulin levels, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, the other problem with beer is that beer contains gluten. And so for some people, the beer is very inflammatory because there may be some residual gluten in there. Um, and the third thing is that alcohol in itself is a toxin. And there's no way, there's no way to avoid that, um, to avoid the fact that alcohol is a toxin because if you have enough beers, you don't walk quite straight and your speech is kind of slurred and you shouldn't be behind a wheel. So um i would just encourage you kind of as you go on a health journey and you start to take control of your health to uh, evaluate the alcohol and evaluate the beer at some point and see if it's kind of worth it there's a couple of good books out there um, there's one called alcohol lied to me by a guy named craig beck and also he has one called control alcohol they're virtually identical by craig beck uh, they're available in uh, audiobook and print, and they kind of talk about the deception. We are um, uh, you know just culturally, culturally we're conditioned to think, oh, you know, drinking alcohol, if you're going to be in front of the barbecue pit, you might as well be drinking a beer because that's normal cultural behavior. but it it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, that's just some conditioning, and a lot of that conditioning is done by the alcohol and beer and spirits industry. In order, I mean, if you're going to go to the beach, you know, you watch the commercial, everybody's at the lake, they're drinking beer. Everybody's at the beach, they're drinking beer. Uh, everybody's standing in front of the barbecue pit, they're drinking beer. Now, that's advertising at work to teach you that that's culturally normal behavior, when actually, uh, actually it's not for a, a large amount of the country. Yeah. Well, again, it, it say, and I know lots of people who may drink, you know, six to ten beers throughout a day. You know, they're watching football. You're, you know, you're having a good time. I'm watching football, drink but, your beer. But, it's but, an advertisement. No doubt about it. No you, doubt you, about you, it. You've been conditioned. Oh, by, absolutely. Conditioned by both the advertising and, and also how you grew up. You know. Sure. Uh, your parents. Um, your, I remember. Uh, but that's fifty grams of carbs. You know what I yeah, mean? Right. On, on, on just just in one day, one football game, you've consumed a max amount of carbs just off the beer. Not we're not even beginning to talk about. And this is another the, the tortilla chips. Well, I was just going to say. Let me tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you another thing that beer at least it does for me. If I were to drink a six pack of beer um, within two hours, kind of like going out to the Chinese restaurant and eating a bunch of rice, and you you feel oh man, I feel good. I had a I had a double helping of that fried rice, man. I'm, two uh -huh. hours later, I'm starving. Yeah. And so th that, right. that, that also is a problem because let's say you drink a six-pack. Uh, well, at least with me, a couple hours later, man, I'm looking for a burrito to eat. There's an interesting thing that <laughs> alcohol... <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> One of the interesting things that alcohol does is uh, uh, your liver... 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Your liver is pumping out a certain amount of sugar, and that sugar is to keep your blood sugar up. So your liver is pumping out sugar, pumping out sugar, so that you always, even if you don't eat any carbs at all, even if you 
fast. For 365 days, your blood sugar never goes to zero because your liver is working to make sugar. Well, when you drink alcohol, uh, say like a six pack of beer, number one, the six pack of beer itself has a lot of carbs in it and that spikes your sugar. And then two hours later, the sugar drops on its own. So that's just the same thing would happen if you ate uh, bread. The spike your sugar an hour later, two hours later, it drops. But now you're, so the, the sugar is dropping and now your liver has switched over from uh, has switched over from making sugar to keep your blood sugar up to to detoxifying the alcohol, and so while your body's detoxifying the alcohol, uh, it's not making sugar, and so you get even hungrier two hours later because oh, your blood sugar is yeah. even lower. Mm -hmm. And that's why it, another thing from the Dr. Bernstein book is uh, he talks about for type two diabetics. Uh, one drink is okay, but if you have two drinks, like a two martini lunch or something like that then uh, within an hour or so your blood sugar can be too low and your blood sugar is too low because your liver switched over from from trying to regulate your blood sugar by making sugar to detoxifying alcohol yeah good yeah. point i didn't think of it that way but so but again it causes more kind of like eating the fried rice at the i mean it does to me anyway it, it's like it's like eating the fried rice only it's a little bit worse because you combine that with the liver. with the alcohol and the liver trying to to, to de detoxify the alcohol out of the system uh it's a it's a it's a cascade of of bad things and an interesting thing but although if you drink whiskey you're okay right you still <laughs> if you if you drink whiskey so the advantage of drinking like a dry spirit or dry wine or whiskey is that you don't have as many carbohydrates so that's the advantage you don't have as many carbohydrates but you can still drop your if you're type 2 diabetic especially you can drop your sugar too low if you have two drinks uh, a couple of hours later yeah An I know lots of diabetics later. are like I can't even drink a beer man I'm top two or I'm insulin dependent they they, they can't they're, they're, they're all the doctors you got to avoid alcohol because of that reason I, I always think that diabetics who are at home with a glucometer have a real advantage over people who aren't diabetic because they can test any anything that I say on the radio they can just test it you know if I say if I say well oatmeal is especially bad for you because oatmeal raises your sugar too high you know well they can they can go home and eat a big bowl of oatmeal and check their sugar an hour later and and see the meter says 300 <laughs> Or if I say, look, if you're diabetic, or if you want to lose weight or diabetic or whatever, and you can have a three-egg omelet with sausage and cheese and bacon on it, and your blood sugar will be dead normal, they can just test it, you know, an hour and two hours later. Um, and so, in a way, I, they make these things called the continuous blood glucose monitor. And uh, it has a, a little, small cannula. It's like a needle, and it goes under the skin and the abdomen. And it checks your blood sugar 24 hours a day, seven days a week, sends it to your smartphone. I mean, it's a cool deal. Uh, and I've often thought, that would be a great thing for any metabolic coaching client. Put on the continuous blood glucose monitor. <laughs> and, and that way, if you eat something, and you see a big spike, you're like, oh, what was in that food? You know, what, what is it that, that caused me to have this spike? The problem is the, the machines, or the last time I checked, they cost about $5,000. Oh, you wow, know? yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's not a, a, not a small expense. But uh, knowing what your sugar is for a type 2 diabetic, it's super helpful. And for anyone who wants to lose weight, it would be helpful too. But just, just borrow your diabetic friend's uh, deal and, and let them check your sugar I borrow their monitor and, and uh, check your sugar yeah I, I again if you're gonna do that the time to check your sugar is right before you eat one hour after and two hours after because if, if you do right before you eat an hour and two hours after then you'll say what was it before I ate the oatmeal how high did it go in about an hour and then how low did it go at two hours mm hmm and Diabetics uh, typically don't go down, uh, they, let's say they're fasting blood sugar, that's first thing in the morning before they've had anything to eat. If their blood, fasting blood sugar is say 120 and then they eat oatmeal, it'll come down a couple of hours later. So maybe it'll spike up to 250 or 300 within an hour or so. Two hours later it might be like 180 and it never quite gets down to 120 again until they fast, until they don't eat overnight. Greg texting in saying, 
continuous monitors are unreliable though too yeah so there's uh, several different things with the continue continuous monitors number one dr bernstein's not a big fan of them because the the uh t there's a time lag in what your actual blood sugar is versus what the monitor says so uh, the monitor is actually about 30 minutes behind what you would do on a finger stick blood glucose test also the 24-hour blood glucose monitor uh, it has a little tube and the tube can get kinked or and so not give you reliable readings so they can and also it has to be placed exactly appropriately you have to calibrate it by calibrating it along with the finger stick to make sure the two read the same thing. So there are a lot of aspects to a continuous blood glucose monitor that might not be perfect. But I just think that uh, if you're interested in losing weight or if you're interested in how food affects you, a continuous blood glucose monitor would be an awesome tool. The thing about it is, though, that, that there's a lot of people, doctor, running around. Like, wouldn't you be interested to know? Like yeah, if, I would. I've it, never if done it's, it. If it's if it's ball, if it's the weekend, and you're going to drink the beer, wouldn't you be interested to know? Well, what does that really? How do? bad does it jack my insulin? How, no, how I high would. does my sugar oh, go? I would, how low does my sugar no, go? I would. Yeah, like, no, when, I would. When I'm feeling like really hungry, the, when I'm feeling really hungry, what does my sugar say? Well, on the continuous monitor, it'd be about 15 or 30 minutes right behind. So your sugar is going to keep going down low. But, I mean, that would just be so interesting. No, I think you're, I think you're right on. But I, but there's also some other things that you can do. For example, uh, what I was going to say was there's a lot of people running around that are pre-diabetic that don't know it. You know, maybe they don't go in yearly, get physicals, do blood work. They they don't know. They're just oblivious. Hey, I eat whatever and you know whatever, whenever, and go on with life. But if you if you start feeling weird, like you're dizzy a lot, or if you feel like, uh, you know, shortness of breath, if you feel, there's a lot of things that your body tells you that, hey, you, you, you've got some problems going on here. You may be pre-diabetic and not even know it, or even full-blown type 2 diabetic and not know it. But if you have some of these symptoms and signs, you better check with your doctor because... Yeah. Definitely you, check you, with you, your doctor. You, you, you may not know and, and sit there and just be like, ah, you know, I'm good, and which would could lead to an aneurysm, could lead all kinds of problems. Yeah, I mean, the big thing about checking with your doctor is either A, I mean, you, if you're short of breath, I mean, you could be having a heart attack, right? So, I mean, you, you need to get that checked out. Uh, and he's either going to say, oh, it's just your blood sugar, you know, and so you have to monitor your blood sugar. And I'll tell you another thing is that, or, or he'll say it's something more serious they have to do something about. Um, lots of people have low blood sugar. They have hypoglycemia. And so they think, oh, well, I can't do a low-carb diet because I have low blood sugar. And that would make my sugars even lower if I didn't eat the carbohydrates. And that's exactly 100% wrong. Uh, doing a low-carbohydrate diet normalizes your blood sugar to where it gets normal and stays there. You don't have the highs and the lows and switches over your body to running on fat. And when you run on fat, you don't get the spikes. You don't get the up and down the spikes. And so uh, hypoglycemia is, uh, responds great to a very low carbohydrate diet. You can get rid of the hypoglycemia. In fact, Dr. Atkins, uh, he described hypoglycemia as the first stage of diabetes because it's when your body, your body is just not handling, not handling sugar correctly. And so, you have highs and you have lows, and people who are hypoglycemic typically feel symptoms when they have their lows rather than their highs. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Yeah, again, it's it's a but it's amazing to me how much sugar plays a role in everyday life on how you feel. Mm -hmm. You know, too high, too low, not enough. You know, on and on and on. And, and, and sugar is inflammatory. People get joint pain from the sugar. I mean, just just from from. Uh, like table sugar, high fructose corn syrup, honey, maple syrup. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they get joint pain, they have digestive upset, they get overgrowth of yeast, and they get leaky bowel and you know, small intestine they bacteria. It totally jacks with the gut. Yeah. And, and if your gut's not operating in optimum levels, I mean, that, that there's a whole slew of issues. And that's there. one of the fabulous things about a low-carb diet is you stop eating the carbohydrates, and the carbohydrates are what feed all that bad bacteria and yeast. Yeah. So stop feeding them. Well, I, I'm I'm on my way. I mean, I, I'm, you know, and it's 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 not that hard to do, but it's recognizing what it is because I think a lot of people don't really understand it. They don't really know 
Okay, carb from... I invited you and the health coach to come see me on Friday. Oh, you did? I texted you. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Well, I wasn't need to well, come. This was last week. <laughs> I come to your class, your seminars on Friday, right? Yeah, it's on okay. Friday. Okay, Fridays. Okay, Fridays. Sorry to there. interrupt you, but I just... no, no, no. I mean, but but that's the educational piece, right? That's right. learning uh, all these things we're talking about. Is that you know, again, you got to know what you're doing before you start something. Uh, it makes perfect sense, but. As always, uh, Dr. Justin Anderson, of course, Cut the Killer Carbs. Check us out on Facebook. Uh, you can check out our website, too, metaboliccoaching.net. We have a lot of videos up there as well. Uh, but you can call us, 448-0322, 448-0322. As always, uh, Dr. Anderson, it's great to have you out on the show and, and talk about these issues. But again, going back to what I said when I opened the show, when I was watching these videos of all these people, 22,000 people packed into this concert and this horrific terrorism event was going on if you watch the video closely it's amazing that the real fit people were doing okay the unfit people were really struggling trying to get a get a, out of arm's way and the best thing you can do for yourself you know because we had a lot of calls earlier in the show today mm -hmm. about well, what do you do about this and what should you do about that and how do you well first and foremost is you got to have good health uh, before anything else. I mean, without health, it's going to be very difficult for you to get out of harm's way, as I illustrated uh, with my time in Iraq, because the first summer I really struggled. By that second summer of Iraq, man, I was 179 pounds. I could carry combat load like it was nothing. Um, strong, lean, fighting machine, baby. You, you got, know what I mean? You, you, got, you got rid of uh, you know, 50 pounds and trade it for your 50 oh, pounds on your that's backpack. Right. And that's right. That's yeah. right. If you're going to think you're going to run out and take a 40, 50 pound rucksack and bug out someplace, uh -huh. if you can't walk from here to the refrigerator without being out of breath, that's not going to do you any good. So a, a real quick reminder, if you do have diabetes before you change your diet, call your doctor and talk to your doctor if you're going to do a low carb diet because Dr. Eric Westman at Duke University, when he puts people on this diet, he cuts their diabetes medicine in half the first day they start. So talk to your doctor before you make any significant diet or lifestyle change. All right. Dr. Anderson, we appreciate that. See you back here next week. Thank you, Have Wayne. a wonderful rest of the week. Stick around now, Unconfused, coming up next right here on AM 580.